Hello, hello everybody. Now we have moved on. We've been, uh, we've already covered a little bit of Monocacy, the Special Orders 191. We've covered uh, Harper's Ferry. We've covered some South Mountain stuff. And here we are actually inching closer to the main event actually, Antietam of course. And we are right along the Antietam Creek. You can see it behind me here. And we are also at the Burnside Bridge. Oh wait! There are other stone bridges that aren't a Burnside Bridge. In fact, this is a very common type of bridge around this area. Dennis Fry is going to talk about that. And this is one of the three main crossings at Antietam, two of which were covered by the Confederates. But this one was just literally a bridge too far. I've never used that one before. Um, and it was uncovered. And it's no surprise the Union is going to make use of that. We'll be talking about that as well. We are happy to have a roughly 1890s or early 1900 photos of this bridge, it's the upper bridge. I've also heard it called the Hooker Bridge, but apparently not popularly. Um, but here it is, so we do have some old assets up here, and we're going to have Union soldiers crossing here. It's important to know that a lot of these bridges, a lot of these roads are, roads are toll roads and toll bridges and whatnot. In fact, the sunken road might be sunken because some people are trying to avoid tolls. I imagine we'll get into this. First, we are at the upper bridge and we're not even going to go to Burnside Bridge during our Antietam coverage. You know why? Because we've been Antietam doing live two or three times already. We also have a battle app. We also have scores of videos about Antietam and we always go to the Burnside Bridge. So look for some of our past coverage. Look on our website. Look on YouTube to see some of our Antietam coverage and look at the uh, Antietam battle app as well for a pretty complete coverage. So um, with no further ado, uh, by the way, share this with your friends, uh, if you will, as many people as possible can see it. Um, I'll hit you with some quizzes later, but for now, let's Let's bring up Dennis Fry to talk about bridges and movements in South Mountain. Hey, Gary. Thanks so much. Hello again, everybody. Um, I'm a native of Washington County, Maryland. You're in Washington County right now, something you may not have known. The very first Washington County in the United States is here, 1776. Literally about two months after the declaration, this county in Maryland is created and named after George Washington. So that's special in itself. As a native of this county, these bridges are special to me. This stone bridge you see here, which in many places would be considered very unique, is not unique in Washington County. We had 30, 30 bridges like this built in this county from 1830 to 1860. The stone you see, limestone, just like the Burnside Bridge, the design you see, very similar to the Burnside Bridge. I almost came out of my shoes a moment ago when Gary said, welcome to the Burnside Bridge. It looks like it is, but it's not. Where are we in relation to, to the Burnside Bridge? Well, we're about three and a half miles upstream up the Antietam Creek or north of the Burnside Bridge. The Antietam Creek's not a long creek. It, it starts in Franklin County, Pennsylvania, just above the Mason-Dixon line flows to the Potomac River, so it's not one of these long tributaries. But here in Washington County, it is crossed over and again by bridges similar to this. Some of them are two arch, some of them are three arch. At the mouth of the Antietam, we actually have a four arch stone bridge uh, that, that crosses the creek. Now, this bridge is still used today. Get that now. You know, when you see the Burnside Bridge, obviously you walk across it, it's pedestrian only. I remember when the Burnside Bridge, you could cross it in vehicles. It didn't close to vehicular traffic until 1964. This bridge, built in the 1830s, still used today by modern traffic. So don't be surprised if you see a car or a truck, maybe in a tractor, because this is the middle of farmland, go across this bridge. Why are we here? Well, the upper bridge is very important because on September the 16th, George McClellan does something that most of you think he doesn't. On September the 16th, the commander of the Army of the Potomac moves, moves. Yeah, no, 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 I know you've read and you're probably saying, oh, that's ridiculous. George McClellan didn't move, he didn't do anything. He did nothing on September the 16th. We all know that. Well, you know something, you're not right. He moves. And this bridge is physical proof, manifestation of that move. You see, McClellan knows that Lee is on the other bank of the Antietam Creek. McClellan can see him. McClellan knows that Lee's been reinforcing himself, that his disparate forces, remember two out of every three Confederates was at Harper's Ferry, Lee's bringing his army back together again. So he's on the other side of the Antietam, and there he is literally holding in place 
while Jackson and the Confederates continue to stream north from Harper's Ferry to Sharpsburg. Lee is reconsolidating here, bringing his army back together. Not good news. Not good news for the Federals. I think McClellan, after South Mountain and the victory of the Union Army at South Mountain, hoped, he hoped, that, that, that Lee had had enough and that Lee would simply go back to Virginia. Well, nearby Sharpsburg, you're only three miles from Virginia, but Lee is not budging. Instead of going backwards to Virginia, Lee is consolidating his forces here in Maryland to continue the invasion. Continue the invasion. No, not to fight a battle along the Antietam Creek. Lee does not have any preconceived notions of setting up defenses here, inviting McClellan across the street to strike him. No, Lee is here waiting to rejoin his army and then to move because Pennsylvania is only about 15 miles from Sharpsburg. So Pennsylvania's in reach. Invasion is on. We're going north. And we got a great road, the sharpsburg Hagerstown Turnpike, that'll take us due north via the compass right to Yankee land in Quaker land. And so this bridge is important because what McClellan's going to do is send about 17,000 men on the 16th, which is a lot considering he only has about 72,000 effectives. He's going to take 17,000, almost 25% of his force, and send them across this bridge on the 16th today, some during the day in the afternoon, and some at night, with the idea of flanking the Confederate Army get to the north of the Confederate Army and try to force Lee to leave Maryland just by a flanking maneuver. Maneuver Lee out of Maryland. One other thing, Joe, that's going to happen, and that is that if he's successful in taking this bridge, which he'll do, there's no Confederates out here. We're way far from the Confederate lines. They can cross the Antietam Creek here without opposition. It's the only place they can get across the creek without Lee opposing them. So they will do that. And if we are successful in getting north of the Confederates, it's going to be a bad day for Robert E. Lee. Those are all great points, uh, Dennis. So, you know, and let's keep in mind that this is September 16th. We are exactly at the 158th anniversary of when Union soldiers will be crossing here. Uh, you know, so very interesting stuff. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. This is Antietam 158, um, and we are at the upper bridge here where, you know, namely elements of the First Corps are uh, going to cross. I already showed you a picture um, of this area. Let me remind you that we're in partnership with Ancestry.com to give away a few items and whatnot. I'm just going to hit you with a few things again. I say two words in succession. You T tell me what those two words are most famously associated with in terms of a quote and who said it. So here's a couple easy ones for you. How about uh, we go with Christmas gift? What quote is that from? Patriot grave, very famous uh, uh, Civil War related quote. And then a harder one. Um, what was I going to go with? Uh, let's go with, you know, another easy one might be proposition that. I bet you can get that one. And then finally, fairly won. If you know what fairly won, what quote that comes from, who said it, and maybe what they meant, put it up there on the screen and you might win a free subscription to uh, Ancestry.com, okay? Now, to take it a little further than Tom just took, and then Dennis just took it, let's bring up Tom Clemens again, Dr. Tom Clemens, expert on all this stuff. Let's just see what he has to say, Tom. Thanks, Gary. Yes, I'm real thrilled to be here at Upper Bridge. Uh, this is very near where I make my home and I drive across this bridge regularly, and as Dennis says, it still carries traffic. You just saw a big piece of farm equipment go across here, not an uncommon sight at all. But on September 16th, as Dennis pointed out, McClellan realizes that two of the three bridges are directly under the guns of the Confederates, and trying to cross a long column of troops across the bridge under fire of the enemy is one of the first things they tell you not to do in any tactical manual of that period. So finding the open bridge, Lee does not have enough men to essentially protect this bridge from a crossing, and so they cross it. Now the road came out of Keatesville and down across this bridge. Those of you who are familiar with this area today, when you go across the bridge, the road forks and you can go to the left or right. Well, in 1862, the right-hand fork was there. That was the road from Keatesville through to Williamsport. But the left fork, the one on the 
left-hand side as you go across the bridge from east to west, there was no road there. And of course, Hooker, who is leading this, he's coming across here in the early afternoon, and he's going to essentially be very aware of the fact that Confederates are nearby. And so he crosses one division on the bridge itself, and this is mid-afternoon, this is broad daylight, and another division will simultaneously cross a little less than a mile downstream at a shallow ford below where the Little Antietam Creek comes in. This is a big deal because several authors have written that this attack was meant as some sort of surprise. Well, you don't cross two divisions simultaneously in broad daylight if you're trying to surprise the enemy. Uh, this is not meant as a surprise. I agree completely with Dennis. This was essentially a movement to try to make Lee move. It's not a flank attack. It is a turning movement. If you get on his flank, he's going to have to fall back. That's the intent. And so essentially one division crossing on the bridge, another downstream at a ford, a third division of the First Corps coming across. McClellan himself rides with General Hooker to give direction to where they're going. Again, this is a myth that a lot of people mistake is that McClellan sat on the porch of the Pry House and didn't move for a couple of days. He's actually moving quite a bit. He is across the creek with Hooker's First Corps. And we'll get to this a little bit later, but on the evening of the 16th, he is under fire with Hooker's First Corps. But for our purposes, McClellan's riding along with him, and they find that this road is going farther north than they want it to be, that it's taking them away from Lee's army much farther than they want to. And so about a mile or less up this road, they're going to start going across lots, across farm fields, to get to some place where they can be on Lee's flank. Uh, and Hooker, of course, uh, is what's known in the old army as a croaker. He's always finding some something to complain about. And so he starts croaking to McClellan and he says, well, my little corps is the only force on the same side of the creek with the whole rebel army. They will gobble me up. And so McClellan will decide to reinforce Hooker. And on the night of the 16th, literally like starting around 11 o'clock at night into the early morning hours, Joseph Mansfield's 12th Army Corps comes down this same road, crosses the same bridge, and follows in Hooker's footsteps. So as Dennis pointed out, you have not one but two corps of the five corps of the Army across the bridge on the night of the 16th preparatory to this battle. And I think that's a very important point to keep in mind. That's great, Tom. It's, it's so tempting to start to get into the battle a little bit more, but we're going to cut it here. Um, you know, but it is interesting, you know, so we, we, you, you've heard how this is going to now start. This is also making Lee aware. Aha! The enemy isn't in my front. They're not just coming from the east. Now they're going to be turning and maybe coming from the north. I might need to, you know, reorganize my battle lines, and maybe I need to start to feel out the enemy. And fighting Wolf Flare on this day, on the 16th, here at Antietam. And we're going to talk about this at another stop. So uh, we're going to take a pause here. Thanks for joining us here at the Upper Bridge. Somebody had asked, you know, well, where are we exactly? Well, I guess I would say that the East Woods um, or the main part of the battlefield and the cornfield are maybe two or three miles off that way. So we're above the battlefield here. It might be four miles. It's hard to say because it's a gravel road, but we are along the Antietam Creek. I, I saw Tom shaking his head, nodding his head, but I couldn't see. So I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> two miles, not even that far. Uh, Tom now tells me, and if I say something and Tom says something, trust Tom when it comes to Antietam or most things, to tell you the truth. Thank you all for watching. Thanks to Chris, Connor, Shannon, and of course to Dennis and Tom with the Save Historic Antietam Foundation. We'll see you soon.